safety cuts out um, extensions. Talk about this wind direction thing. It is. Yeah. Just talk about it. Please, if you want to do that now, please, as quickly as you can. One more. Thank you. And good evening and welcome in the words of David Frost. Um, if you've never been to the Portico Library before, welcome to the library. We are primarily a library, um, but we also hold many, many events such as this, and I hope that you enjoy this evening and your experience in the library. I'm just going to go through some very quick housekeeping, um, so you know where the fire exits are in the case of an emergency. There is one behind you. Good evening, and welcome again uh, to what is... Well, I've really interesting things whereby there is somebody in Manchester and things happen and then you think, oh, I wish I knew more about them because I never knew enough when they were here. And then you wait and then suddenly there's films, documentaries, books, plays, articles and everything. But uh, a great joy to me over the last couple of months was reading um, an early proof of Mick Middle's book on Chris Seedy because that's who we're here to celebrate tonight, Chris Seedy, stroke Frank Sidebottom. Um, and just very quickly, I think Mick's done an amazing job and uh, it opened up many, many avenues of thought, ideas and brought me a great deal of happiness reading it. We've got a great panel for you tonight who I'd like to introduce. Mr. Mick Middles himself. Then we have been, uh, not in any particular order, but uh, chronological. Say. <laughs> We're going to kick off with Barry Spencer here. Right. Uh, just two impressions. Uh, a giant in broadcasting history couldn't be here tonight, so instead, <laughs> we've got a local lad uh, who's moved, moved around a bit. And uh, I remember standing on a street corner in Islington with you one evening in the uh, 1970s, bemoaning our fate to be cut off from Mother Manchester. But we that both seem to. There's a lot of publishers. Yeah. We, we, we both made our way back. So, that was yeah. summer. so Mark Ratcliffe, please. Yeah. 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 And we have representing the Lawnmower Guild, and all the way from Timberley, we have Mr. Neil Taylor, one of the gentlemen responsible, the people responsible for the fantastic statue or the, the, the fact that it's sited where it is and uh, street sculpture, street art and a wonderful tribute to Chris Stroke Frank. So without further ado, um, we're, we're going to try it with one microphone. I'm going to sit down every time I think there's a problem, I'm going to gesticulate and shout from here. So here we go. Mick, kick it off. <sighs> Blimey. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't let Frank loose in there, would you? <laughs> We're looking around, I mean, it's just it's so inappropriate. But, but, but what a beautiful place. I lived 58 years in Manchester and I never knew this was here. But a funny thing happened. Um, about three months ago, I was reading uh, Ed Glynnett's Compendium of Manchester Buildings book. And uh, a, a fantastic book, by the way, about all beautiful buildings in Manchester. And I read this thing about the portico and, and that business about uh, the, the, the saw. I thought, oh, I've got to go there, I've got to go there. Two days later, Charlton Bookshop got in touch with the uh, Empire Publications and said, do you want to do a Frank launch at the Portico? Well, that's just one of about 20 weird coincidences. You may think it's a mild coincidence. Believe me, there's been some, many have been very, very weird during the, uh, this, 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 <laughs> the gestation period of this book, including the fact that uh, I actually met my wife Vicky about four years ago and moved into Ashton Mersey. I had no idea that Chris spent his three, first three years in Ashton Mersey. I had no idea. And uh, suddenly I was surrounded by uh, lovely people from the... Can you hear me, everybody? Yeah. yeah. All right, all right. 
lovely people from the freshers between Barry, Rick Sarko, uh, Paul Molyneux, Chris is great, great uh, young friend from school. Um, the schools Chris went to were just around the corner. The whole thing just kind of fell into place. Just to go back a little bit, um, I did speak about this book with Chris. Chris muted it actually uh, about, about 15 years ago in the cafe in, uh, in gone off. The cafe of Sainsbury's in Altrincham. And um, he said, could you do a book on me? And I said, well, I'd love to. And it'd be a great book because it is a unique story. It is a totally, I can't, in the annals of show business, I cannot think of a story remotely like the Chris Seavey, Frank Snybottom story. But what he said to me, Chris, was, it would have to be in the right spirit. And what I think he meant by that was, it wouldn't be a day-to-day -day linear biography. It would be somewhat chaotic. And I do feel I've achieved that. It is somewhat chaotic. So I hope if you, if you go away and read it, um, hopefully a bit, a bit of Chris and Frank will come through. I'll just tell you a little, a little bit about the first time I met Chris. Um, it was in a freshest gig at the Boundary Pub in Oldham. Have you played that, Barry? Probably. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> you can't remember. Well, I'll tell you what, you, uh, you know, you probably were, but no one would come with me in those days. I was writing the uh, wide reviews for Sounds magazine in 1978. And uh, what you used to do was look in the listings magazine, the New Manchester Review, and you'd pick out bands. And the only thing I knew about this band was all their equipment was painted pink. So I sold that to Sounds, and they went for it. They went, yeah, that sounds great, go, go for it. So I drove up on a wet Thursday to the Boundary Pub, and I'm not joking, there were people playing dominoes. And there were people playing dominoes throughout the performance. And this band, this band came on, and they didn't look like your post punk Manchester Band. They didn't have badly fitting suits, so they didn't play funk very badly, and uh, they didn't have short back and sides. And the lead singer had a, had a Hawaiian shirt on and pink cords. And they were nice. They didn't insult the audience. Oh, I'm used to this because because we used to go to see the ball and they just insult you straight away. You know, like, hope you like our set. You know, uh, it's really nice. It's full of love songs. What? What, what a love song? Well, anyway, it was a great. It was a great gig, and. Uh, I met you all there afterwards. You all remember. We had a beer. Tris came over and said, can I have your address? And which schoolboy error. I said, yes. About four weeks later, after the review came in, I was living in my parents' house in a, a beautiful, pristine house. A massive package came. Postman, like this. I pulled it in the house. Oh, what is this? What is this? I have no idea what it was. My parents stood around and all this. So I prized it open. And... A million polystyrene balls went <laughs> And five years later, they were still being swept up in the house. It's probably still out of days. Should have read the signs, shouldn't I? Should have read the signs. The freshest by this time, we're up and running. One of the great outsider bands of Manchester, I think. Um, uh, not just people who dress or their own music, it's just that you, you weren't sort of um, within the Manchester elite. You're like the sort of the Jets who you played with many times, didn't you? And, and, and all that sort of thing. Barry, I'm going to pass to you now. Tell me about how you joined the Freshers. Because you didn't know Frank before the Freshers, did you? Uh, yeah. No, I didn't know Frank before the Freshers, no. <laughs> uh, that would have been a bit difficult. Uh, I would be worried about him if he was Frank. But uh, I've got, uh, it, this is a true story, actually. Uh, my, my best friend, uh, I have two best friends, uh, and one of them is, uh, is uh, Paula's brother, uh, who, who was Chris's wife. Uh, and it's a very true story, this, that we were at uh, another best friend, uh, uh, 18th, 18th birthday party. And, uh, you know, how the drink's going down, and it's absolutely true. We, she, she came over, we started chatting, and then she said, uh, here, Barry can play the guitar, why don't you ask him to join your band? So Chris said, do you want to join me band? And I said, what are they called? And he said, the Freshies. No kids, isn't it? Yeah. I said, that's a fucking shit name. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea, never did. And he said, uh, he said, do you want to join the band? So I said, yeah. And that was it. I joined the band. And it was like I was in the band from that conversation. Next thing I do, he says, you're in the, we'll do a rehearsal, and we rehearsed, and that was it. So that's how I joined the band. You may not remember that, but that is exactly how it, how it happened. You were very drunk. <laughs> 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 you were. 
and you were pregnant with Skill, which is not good. <laughs> but uh, that's how I joined the band. And that. I remember that night where people getting thrown out of the window. <laughs> <laughs> there was, yes. I, I wasn't responsible for all. I remember that bit. Yeah. No, but it is actually a true story, and that's how we, and that's typical of Chris. He, he effectively just, do you want to join the band? Yeah. Okay. And that was it. Harry. Yeah. You told me that how long have you, how long have you been in the fashion sport? About uh, was it three or four years? You told me that not once in those three or four years, despite the trials and tribulations the band trying endlessly trying to make it. And even when you did make it, you didn't make it because a bit of bad luck kicked in, which yeah. I'll just ask you about. Um, you told me you didn't have a single band argument in those, in those years. No. Nope. And that's not just, that's not just unusual, that's weird. It is a bit weird. <laughs> it is a bit weird. Uh, and I'll elaborate on that. Um, uh, I can actually honestly say there was never any bad words throughout, from A to B. Um, it, it was, it was a, a laugh all the way through. We were all committed you know, to do the best we could musically, but we just got on so well. It was uncanny, really. There were, there were the odd occasion, I was talking about this before to someone, and um, uh, he did come to me once, and I used to do this quite a lot, where he'd say, I've got this homage to um, the Beatles, it's called An Octopus, I want to record it and put it out. Do you want, do you want to do the guitar? And it was, I've got, I have to say, it was cat. <laughs> and he said, the, the octopus, it was just useless. The, 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 I love that song. It was awful. It was god awful. He said, uh, so he played it to us. And I said, do you want to, I said, I do not want to be associated with this song. And I, yeah. yeah. Just to have a little story to that, I remember Barry coming at Manchester Poly telling me that. He said, I'm leaving the band. I can't cope with this bloody song. And the funny thing is, Chris pestered me and pestered me and pestered me to go down to the sounds office and, and push the freshies, push the freshies. And I eventually got down and there was a circle of people in the sounds office. Dave McCullough was there, Gary Bushell was there, uh, Jeff Barton was there, the heavy metal. There's all these factions of people. And they said, play us the freshies if you want them on the cover of sounds. So this is absolutely true. So I gave them that EP, was it the Mocha Cadiz EP? Or was it? Yeah, yeah. And um, I think it was Gary Bushell flipped it over. And put the last track on. And it was octopus. <laughs> and they all turned around and went. And I think Iron Maiden went on the cover. I think they probably made the right decision. As it happened. So I must ask you though, because, because we'll, we'll move on, but um, the, the story about I'm in love with the girl from the Virgin Megastore checkout desk. It was a hit, and it wasn't a hit, wasn't it? I mean, I still regard it as a hit, but you had a bit of bad luck with that, didn't you? I mean, do you really think that you'd made it at that point? Well, like, make it, whatever, but I, I just was, you know, enjoying the ride, quite frankly. Uh, but there is an element of uh, goddamn bad luck with this, because it is absolutely true. When you used to have to buy plastic to get in the charts, you had to buy, you had to sell so many, and it was all the BRMB shops and what have you. Uh, and we were hovering around, and then we got booked to do Top of the Pops, and it was relatively well known at the time. That if you did Top of the Pops, it added a certain number to your sales, you could, went up the charts, and it was kind of a hit, you know. Um, when we were put to do Top of the Pops, they went on strike. <laughs> <laughs> they went on strike for four in weeks. <laughs> and we, we loaded that van for four weeks to do Top of the Pops. And each time they, they, they got the phone and said, uh, Fred, it's off. They're still on strike. And by the time they went back, because Megastore was in the charts for ages, being played all over the country, up and down like a fiddler's elbow, by the time it came to actually go on top of the pops, you know, and, and they were all back for the strike, it dropped. So they couldn't put us on. So that was it. We you did the play out We did, yeah, we did, um, we did a, a video, uh, one of the first videos to be on top of the box. Actually, um, and what it was is uh, going around Virgin Megastore in Manchester, and a little bit of us watching the TV of that in Ilderondas from Room. I don't know where that is now, but that was they played Top of the Pops out, one of the, one of the uh, Top of the Pops out with that. So that was our sort of, um, you know, sorry, that's but off you go type thing, which is a shame. Yeah.
All right, I've got to ask you, when you're in the freshers, um, the first sight of Frank, who comes into the store at this point, can you remember the first time you were introduced to Frank? And then what on earth did you make of him? Uh, yeah, that's pretty cells. <laughs> um, when I first saw what he was doing, and, and you have to understand that what he was doing was to, it was, it was practicing with Tosh Ryan, the manager, to use the camera, the, the, the body camera, and a bit of some very raw uh, editing type facilities. So Tosh could practice filming and then get that filming and edit it. So Chris came up with Frank Sidebottom, which was the big paper mashing head with big eyes, and well, you, you know how it is. Uh, and I saw it and I thought, my God, has it turned into this? Uh, and, and, and I have to say that uh, Frank Sidebottom, in the early days, and, and, and possibly even still now, it, 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 you split. You either loved him, you got him, or you hated him. You didn't get him. Um, and I can remember, I, I, was, I was doing some uh, theatre at the time, and I had this character, who, uh, an American thing, and he, and he said, would you, would you, would you sort of um, compare, and, um, uh, and I could go off and get changed and come on as different characters. So I said, yeah, that's not a problem. So we had two gigs booked in, and it's, it's, it's a great story. And, and I remember Chris Evans was driving the bloody van as well. And, um, and the first gig we did at Liverpool University, um, and he did, we did the gig, and I, I, you know, did what I did, and, and they wanted to kill him. They really did not get it, and they even, it was a good job the pine pots were plastic. It was really, really bad, um, and he came on at the end with monopoly money saying, thank you, thank you, which made them even worse. <laughs> and on the way back, uh, down the M62, he said to me, are you alright for tomorrow? I to London Polytechnic. And I said, are you joking? <laughs> Could you not see what was happening? He says, well, you know, that's, that's just life, isn't it? So, you know, I, it was Chris, that. So I thought, yeah, why well, not do anything else? So we went to London. I could not believe the contrast between one audience and another audience. He only had to fart and they would like, he didn't fart, actually, because that wasn't what he did. But he could do no wrong. They laughed at every single thing he did. And, and I was absolutely astonished that two audiences could take him so differently. It just amazed me. But I, su I summed up what Frank Sandra was about by those two gigs. You either loved him or you hated him. Mark Radcliffe, well known to everybody of course. Uh, perhaps not so many people know that uh, he had an alter ego um, of Mr. Emerson Lake. The Green Grocer from Timberley and um, erstwhile drummer of the old Blimey Big Band, um, which I think is a great achievement, actually, Mark, I have to say. And um, Mr. Emerson Lake, you know, to be honest, I didn't get the joke until about a year ago when I interviewed you for this book. Um, the Emerson Lake joke. Emerson Lake and. I didn't get it, side bottom. Well, Frank, Frank won't allow it because he wanted to be the front, didn't he? Yeah. So it ruined the joke. Well, that's why, that's why I didn't get it. Yeah. You, you presented Transmission on the radio for many years, didn't you? Which is like the, the John Peel show of Piccadilly, I seem to remember. Yeah. Did you play the Freshers a lot in those days? Did, did you, I, mean, I, I can't believe you were bombarded with polystyrene balls and things, you know. I was, um, I was bombarded with loads of stuff, but I didn't know Chris. I mean, I, th I think when I t came to thinking about it, that, um, hello Paddy. <laughs> um, I um, uh, you should get him up here. <laughs> um, I um, I was when I was talking to you and I thought all those years I was doing that program at Piccadilly and and uh, Chris was sending me all those. What did he used to put it on? Eleven fifty-four was it? The the, 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 the what did he used to put it on? Eleven thirty-seven. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. And all those things and all the all the promo things and he used to say, you know, I, I used to have loads of kind of um, you know promo copies and everything and things with handwritten letters from Chris and all strange artwork and drawings of Frank and all kinds of things. But I don't think I met Chris before he came to Radio 1 in London and I was producing that Saturday afternoon show. And, and he came down and did that computer game, did I? Yeah, you did a late night Piccadilly. Yeah, Cures for Insomnia. He was there, he was there. Was he? The time. Was he? He used it? to come home and rave about you and everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was my new best mate. <laughs> 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 oh, I've got a new best mate. 
Mark Clay Park, I feel like I'm going to his radio show every night. He was always, well, where was he then? <laughs> <laughs> he was way now. No, he wasn't even there. No, no it's all becoming clear now. Uh, uh, no, I mean, I think that's, I stand with Paul, I think that is the truth. And, um, but, you know, uh, and, and so, mm -hmm. our first recording evening, you know, getting all that fresh stuff and playing the odd record and everything. Um, but, um, when I was, I was working at Radio 1 as a producer for the Saturday afternoons and he came down and he did an interview and I think he's done um, that computer game for the ZXT yeah. and he, uh, The biz or something. Fine train. Fine train. Anyway, he did this game and I was like, I thought I didn't really understand it. You know, I still don't understand computer games now, so I had no idea what he was on about. But I thought, well, it seems like an intriguing book. And, uh, uh, and so we went for a pint after the show. He said, I've got to get the next train back. So then you know what happened. You know, he just missed every trade for the rest of that day, <laughs> which was crit all over, wasn't it? And you know, presumably, I've been told you, I'll be back by half seven tonight. Uh, I'll be back by half seven, but not specifying what day. <laughs> yeah. and, so, and I was moving back to Manchester, and we just agreed to meet up, you know, and we, I, we just sort of clicked in a way, and sort of, we just made each other laugh as we sat over a pub table. And so it was at that, at that stage, it was no more than that. And he told me he was doing this frag thing with a big head on, you know. Oh, so, well, that's some shit, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll go out for a pint and go away. You know, but it, it was just that was, I was you know, I'd, I'd moved to London and then I was moving back. And so, you know, most people had shunned and disowned me because I'd, uh, I'd moved to the south. And so I thought I might be friendless when I came back. And so I thought I'd uh, latch on to Chris. <laughs> and that was, that was where it all began, really. <laughs> How did we get you into the band then? How did Mr. Emerson Wayne come about? Because uh, it was the start of many adventures, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, it, it, it was the start of many adventures. Think, funnily enough, I was thinking about what you said about he never had an argument. Yeah. And I don't remember us having any arguments. Not until later, until lots of space came, yeah. Um, but um, it was. Uh, I think you had two separate lives, didn't you? I did, yeah. Because I, 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 I was. One side of the. Yeah. I was like, I, I, I was trying to work for a living, I was talking about this. I mean, he, he asked me to join, I had nothing else to do, you know, and it seemed like a lap, really. And, uh, and, and so I was playing, and I always remember playing, he said, do you want to play drums in the old Blimey Big Band? I said, yeah, I said, who, who else is in it? He said, uh, oh, it's just you. Were you the drums? <laughs> yeah, it's just you. Know, so, you know, I was, I can play, I can play guitar and keyboards, I, you know, I'm, I'm shit on a range of instruments, and he liked, he liked that, and so, um, he, he, he said, he, he was, yeah. so he was playing a little tiny keyboard and that banjo with a bit of foam under the string. And he said, do you play drums along with that? I thought, oh, yeah, it sounds easy enough, you know. And I've always liked playing the drums because you can get pissed and still not play the wrong notes. <laughs> and, um, and so then he said, but like, he said, no, he said, I need to move around. saying, can you play the keyboard? I said, well, how hard can it be? You know, so, I it. so then um, I was playing the drums and the keyboards, so I got rid of the top bit of the drum kit and I just had the bits I play with my feet and then um, the keyboard on a little collapsible table like that. And we talked like that as a kind of like cross between the Pet Shop Boys and Steptoe and something. <laughs> and, uh, and, so like, you know, and then he said, uh, then he said one day, he said, oh, he said, I've got, uh, uh, we need a bigger band now. So we're going to get loads more people in the band. And I said, okay, great, all right then. And so um, he got Rick Sarko. Um, he might have got your brother, Mike, on the saxophone. Anyway, he got about three more people in the band. But when we got together to do it, I was still on drums and keyboards. <laughs> <laughs> that was Chris Timmy. And I remember playing at Liverpool Uni, funnily enough, and he said, we're going to do Bohemian Rhapsody. He says. And so he says, can you learn the piano to that? So, so, yeah. so uh, it's, not, it's actually not that, it's not that difficult Bohemian Rhapsody. It's basically four chords. And he said, well, what do they do? They've got a grand piano here. So he said, he saw that after we'd done the sound check. And so there's like a big, it was, it was about twice the width of this, a massive student hall. And Chris says, so uh, can you do the intro on the grand piano? And then we'll come in when you come on the drums. And it was about fucking hundred yards away. And, and, and so Chris loved this, so I, I went right over on that side. Ding, 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 And then there was a big gap on that. It's very late. And, and, and that was typical. And he, he absolutely loved that. And all the people at the, at the college were saying, if you use the piano, we'll move it to the side. He says, no, no, no. He says, in fact, could you move it further? <laughs> It's like, it's like Dale, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, very like that, yeah. 
You tell me a great story, actually. You, 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 you've got to tell us now about the uh, the travel snooker yeah. story, which yeah. um, uh, a classic old blimey big band tale, I think. It's yeah. fair to say. Well, um, Chris, uh, in the early days, it was me and Chris and my, the manager, Mike Doherty, um, who, like, I don't know if any of you have met Mike Doherty, uh, who's sort of, well, he's been, he's had some adventures himself, <laughs> hasn't he, and some bumps and very few problems, and there's a couple of bits that'll never come back, but he's still really, he's still funny, and he, I mean, him and Chris made me laugh, they talk quite similar in a way, I thought, Mike and Chris, I mean, you wouldn't, you were too close to Chris, when I first met them, they had that accent, like, and I don't want to say, yes, Mark, you know, we've got to get down to one door, we really pronounced and all that, and Chris seemed to talk like mine when we were together, but, um, and we always had these great plans, and one of the great plans that I remember, um, and, and I love this, and I put that in the book, was, um, we said, when we make, um, when we make loads of money, uh, the three of us, we're going to form a company called The Great Big Company, do you remember this, and the dream we had was a tower block in Manchester, we've got a massive office block, but we were going to make the front of it look like um, the front door of a two up, two down, <laughs> but like hundreds of feet high. And we were going to have a step, uh, the, ste the doorstep was going to be about 60 feet. We were going to have a 75 foot pint of milk on the doorstep. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing I know is that if we'd have got millions of pounds, if we'd have got the into pounds, I'd have said, well, oh, maybe I'll have a nice house in Cheadle instead. Yeah. And Mike Doherty would have said, I'll go to Thailand. And Chris would have said, you bastards, we've got to get the 75 foot bottle of milk. And he'd have been absolutely wrong, you know, and that's why, that's why we love and cherish and remember Chris. And that, that he was always the one, frustrating as it was sometimes, and difficult to live with, a God I can't even imagine. Um, and um, that you know, he, he would take the joke too far. He never would know when to stop with anything. But that was part of his. That's what we love about him. Because the rest of us, ultimately, like most people, were too sensible. And one little example that Mick's talking about. We were talking one day about how could we make um, the van journeys go a bit quicker. You know, we had a we had an idea. I remember we were we had an idea for Travel Twister. Which was, uh, we were going to have a, a red dot, a yellow dot, a blue dot, and a green dot, and put one on each hand and foot and just stand wherever you wanted. That, that was one plan. And the other plan was travel snooker. And so we talked about how great was travel snooker. And so, uh, and, and I just thought nothing about it, you know, went back to Piccadilly Radio or whatever, and said, uh, uh, travel snooker. And then um, they came to uh, pick me up for a gig, which was always the time, the time it was always shit. That used to piss me off, that was why I think I left in there, because I'd get home from work. Yeah. Like, check the baby was all right and all that, you know, and, say, do that, and then get ready, you know, they say, we'll pick you up at five. So you do all that, half six, you know, they pick you up, and then they say, oh, um, well, we're playing in, like, you know, I don't know, Stafford or something. They said, oh, yeah, but we've got to go and get some T-shirts in, in bloody Urbston or something. So you go back through the rush hour the wrong way. And about two and a half hours later, I passed the top of my road. <laughs> 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 uh, but, and, and so uh, one time, uh, and, and, and so they yeah, so they're picking me up for a gig, and uh, Mike knocked on the door, and, he, and he, actually I don't know if Mike was there. Chris Evans was driving the van yeah. again. We were playing at the Canal Cafe Theatre in Maida Vale, so we were driving from Cheadle to Maida Vale. I'm back because we never stayed anywhere. We had enough money to stay anywhere, and um, we um, someone knocked on the door. I think Sarko was there. Um, and uh, anyway, so the software had knocked on the door and said, right, we're riffy. And, and uh, I went to the van, and it was a minibus, flat back seats, no headrest in those days. And um, I, I opened the back door, and Chris was in a waistcoat and bow tie, <laughs> with a half size snooker table over the backs of the seats, <laughs> chalking a cue with a fag in his mouth. And he just looked at the back of the van, and he says, right, you're not. He says, shall I break? <laughs> And so, and so we set off to London with Chris Evans driving um, and uh, with, with, with a snooker table and we're pulling up a bike to people going like trying to get a good <laughs> And of course, we play a snooker thing that every, every time we went round the corner, all the balls just went <laughs> So it's just, it's, this, is, this is a flawed plan, this. He said, yeah, he said, yeah, he said, you know, but I've got the solution now. Velcro balls. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, this is, this is Chris taking the joke too far. And the thing about it was, why he took the joke too far? Because he put this snooker table, there was nowhere to fucking sit. <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to get to London, we're like, we're like that. 
against the window. Yeah. And someone played snooker. And then when we got there, uh, we, we played this game, and Chris Evans lost the keys to the van. Um, and, and so we, we take turns at sleeping on the snooker table. So actually, it worked out quite well. But that, yeah, that, that was life on the road with the old boys, yeah. <laughs> Mark, but I think that there's one extra twist to that story. Did he not make you say, I can't find the keys, and you had to sleep in the van? Ah, but he did have the keys. Did you come with us that night? Yeah, I can't remember anything about who was there, yeah. Well, he did have the keys, but he just told me a better story if he slept in the van. Oh, I don't know. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he found the keys about four in the morning. It's too scared to tell us. Oh, right. We were traipsing around Baby Bell, there was those little, uh, those little shacks where, there was, there was like, there were 24 hour cappers and things in them, there was a little shack that we used to serve the uh, cab drivers, and we queued up and said, can we have a drink, we're not cab drivers, can we have a drink, we're stranded, and they said, no, fuck off. <laughs> so you giving up about, I gave... in the morning, started walking home. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I oh, but it's cute. I, I'm not sleeping on this snooker. Anymore. I walked to uh, Houston Station and waited for the you first did. train you and did. went straight back to work. But that was the thing that I always remember. Went straight back to work to my normal life. Yeah, yeah. well, as you quite right, I had two bars of you go, go to. I remember we played at the Cricketers Arms at Kennington Oval quite a lot. Is it better with or without the mic? Without. Yeah. And we went to the Kennington Oval and, uh, and, and yeah, we just absolutely, that was the thing when we were driving down and, and Chris Evans was driving the van and stopped the van and says, we got to St John's Wood and says to, and he said to, he won the window down and says to this blog walking on the phone, he says, excuse me mate, is this London? <laughs> and, and, this, and this bloke says, uh, yeah, he says, right, he says, where do you want this wood? <laughs> he said the whole journey was a right lap, you know. Uh, we, played, we, played at, uh, we played at Kennington Oval at the Cricketers, we absolutely leathered before it started. I remember playing this game and people just passing pints over the crowd and getting absolutely slaughtered and everything. So we finished about 11 or whatever. And then we did a couple of drinks, and then inevitably we'd go back to someone's flat, you know, or whatever. And then you'd suddenly, I'd suddenly think, oh, it's two o'clock, you know, I'm working tomorrow <laughs> in Manchester. So I'd say, oh, can we go, you know, and Mike was always driving, you know, at 120 mile an hour, probably. And we'd go, he'd, he didn't drink, but what else he was doing, I have no idea. <laughs> I was a bit naive about all that in them days, I think. Um, and so uh, we'd get up, and it'd be like, you know, Half uh, four or something, uh, five o'clock, so, uh, you, and you think, oh, you know, sandbag services are not far off home now. And then uh, Chris would say, um, oh, shall we go in the Northwood services and have sausage, egg, and chips? I'd say, shall we just fucking go? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I'd be outvoted. And so we go to, uh, uh, you know, having earned about kind of 20 quid each, sausage, egg, and chips at Northwood services would be about 14 pounds. <laughs> And then Chris would go on the machines for about 45 minutes, <laughs> and then the rest of the money had gone. So once again, I, I used to try and time it to get home, just as my first daughter Holly, who's now 27 with her own kids, was waking up, you know, and give her a morning feed, and then, uh, and then have a shower and go to work. And so that's, uh, that's why I'm the knackered wreck I am today. <laughs> Given all that, where did it all go wrong? <laughs> Absolutely loved him to death, and and, uh, and you know we went uh, we we spent a lot of time together. And I think maybe in a sort of way. I mean, our lives just went in different directions, and we kind of used each other up a little bit. I think you know we we kind of had a real uh, I don't know we had a real purple patch where we just kind of talked about things and did uh, radio timply and all that. And, and uh, I think we were. It was funny. I was re I was I was I was thinking about it, and, uh, and, and there was something Patrick Patrick Gallagher said in the book. Actually, I was reading your book last night. I got a copy of the book last night. Um, check the index for myself and scan those bits. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, uh, but Patrick had said that um, it, when me and Mark Riley started becoming Mark and Lard, he was kind of quite surprised because he thought me and Chris had more of an affinity and everything. But I don't think that it would have worked because I don't. Chris Chris would not have. He was too, he was a solo artist, but he didn't he want to share. Like, he he wouldn't have wanted to share. And maybe I, maybe I was thinking about it, maybe I didn't either. You know, maybe I wanted to do that radio show and I knew exactly what I wanted to do. 
And me and Chris would have fallen out eventually because we'd have argued. He used to do bits and everything, didn't he? he used to. I remember he used to do. <laughs> and one of his things that I used to love was uh, uh, tales of the expected. <laughs> 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 was, it was a, this character called Phil Booth, and he would have got Hello, Phil Booth here with another tale of the X Factor. Just in a, a, a speech impediment. You know, there's a story, a ghost story, about him going down a dark and alley, and I thought so much, every time I turned around, there was no one there. But I could feel this person, you know, and a person on my shoulders, and I could feel it and everything. And, uh, and when I turned around and took my coat off, there was a coat hanger in the shoulder. <laughs> As expected. <laughs> I'm Phil Booth. Join me next time for another tale of the expert. <laughs> but but, but uh, and, and Patrick had said that he he felt that when me and Mark made a partnership, that Chris was he said that he was a little bit bitter about that deep down. But I never felt that, or never really. Did you think there was any bitterness there? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. Okay. Well, you're all right then. Chris was with me for six months and during that time, when he lived with me. Um, Bear in mind, I was a great friend of Mark Riley before he worked with you. This is Patrick Gallagher, by the way. He used to run the comic Boink in Manchester and also used to write lots of bits for, uh, for me and Mark uh, yeah. Riley. Yeah. But um, I, I was a school with Mark Riley before you worked with him and you were quite well. He was like a best friend when I started the point. Uh, and we worked closely with Mark. And um, when I got to TV, the kids were called Brown and Ben. Mark then sort of uh, got to radio with, as a uh, um, Tony McLean in the mission as a plugger, and yeah. then he met you and developed a work relationship with you. And um, I, I kind of felt with Mark uh, that in terms of his relationship with me, uh, that, that he was sort of like quickly sort of move on to somebody else and get associated with them, yeah? Yeah. Uh, but I felt with Chris, your sense of humour and Chris's were closer and bonded in terms of the way you had the MO thing and the way that, that kind of worked. I mean, yeah. And I mean, I played with you on a, a couple of gigs, and I remember this where. He came on to my house and rehearsed at my house, and uh, it's that old kind of story where Chris said to me, you're in the band with guitars, I said, the shit guitars, I said, that's all we need. And uh, <laughs> I remember, we, we'd been for, for a part, we went back to my house, and uh, we, I, I was asking for us to record some of the rehearsals so I could play after we got, because I was so bad. And uh, they had a little tape going to go and you see it aside. And it went fine, you see, and, uh, or ish. So when you got the gun, I sort of played back the tape. And you recorded on it, Patrick, you're fucking shit. Suddenly <laughs> 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 already. Yeah. But again, I'll go back to you and uh, I, that's why I thought you and you and um, Chris had a closer sort of a uh, uh, comedic sort of sense. Well, really. Chris had, I think Chris did one of the things that uh, really was like, you know, Chris didn't want to. If I say he didn't want to share, that sounds very ungenerous, and I don't mean it that way, because he was very generous. In fact, half the time when we did gigs the two of us, and I had a decent job, and you had no money, and he would try and split the money half and half with me, I would say, no, you come just, you know, it's like, give me a bit, and, you know, take the money off, for God's sake. But, so he was generous in that sense, and when he had his money, God knows, it just went through his fingers, didn't it, you know, and we all know generosity so much, but he had it, like, if he, he couldn't delegate anything, so if he was colouring something in or drawing something, you know, he had to do it. There were loads of great artists who could have taken that burden off him, but that was his obsessive nature. And so me and him working together beyond the bits that we, I was happy as Emerson Lake, because it was his vision. I mean, I sort of did my bit, but within the confines of the little bit of space he, he allowed me. You know, and if we'd have done in a radio show, you know, I was doing that and saying we need to do this, and Mark did those bits. I mean, me or Chris would never, ultimately, I think, have, have ducked under each other. I think it would have been a, a, a clash of egos, really, and I think it would have ended It would have ended with us not being friends, and we ended as friends, and so I'm more grateful for that. It, it wasn't disciplined enough to... to I, I, that's what I... Well, I mean, you should. I mean, you've got to mm. do it every you day. Not yeah. that time. Yeah. You know. Yeah. 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 He didn't have a sensible side. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't have a sensible side. No. Yeah. No sensible side. There's been no rules. That's a CP. I'm sorry. You can't. You can't. No. no rules. Right. I want to bring in Neil Taylor because um, Neil was the uh, next council of Timpley, and um, the thing about the, the Frank story, if not the Chris story, is how it, how it. Mushroomed sadly after his death. And, uh, you know, everything he wanted seemed to come true afterwards. Films, books, documentaries, statue. The statue was a great idea. Um, I think it was music at Castlefield Wake, wasn't it? But probably Mick Fraser, I think, that 
promoter, and um, it's great to have a great idea, but getting a statue up is not an easy thing. And um, I, think, I think it's fair to say, without, without Neil's um, drive and ambition and, and, and fight for that statue, it, it just never would have happened. Is, that, is it true to say that? How, how, can we just ask you before, before that, how did you get to know Chris yourself? Because you worked with him before, before I think a few years before. So how did you meet Chris and that? Was he, was he just your local character? Have you been to work? It all goes back um, many, many years. I've lived in the Timbley area all of my life. So if you go back to the late 70s when the punk thing was going on, the Freshies, it was really exciting for the kids at the time. Like, the Freshies are going to make it, you know? Um, and you know, the, the buzz was, it's going to happen, it's not going to happen, it's going to happen, it's not going to happen. And back in those sort of days, CB radio sort of came about, you know, and everybody was talking about the music scene and everything that was going on. Time went, went by uh, and it was bad luck to want to actually what happened with the freshies. You, you, you yeah. deserved it, to be truthful, you know, you did deserve it. Well, no, I don't know. A little bit, a little bit. <laughs> and um, many years on, um, I was fortunate uh, to have got elected as a, a local councillor in 2006. And such down with Chris, uh, we were exchanging messages before this on MySpace, whether you all remember the old days of MySpace. Because Frank would not do Facebook because it was crap, so he was not going to do social media apart from MySpace. And I said to Chris, you know, you're a cult comedian, but the local people have not got a clue who you are. No, nobody knows who you are. So I was very fortunate to have got Chris, or Frank Seibosom, involved with um, the Autumn Festival, which is like a really big local um, thing that happens each year. 20,000 people come to it. Right down to some smaller events, uh, the Tiffany Country Fair. Um, and we decided to actually one day to actually do a spoof on politics. Like Chris, Frank Seibosom, would become the mayor of Timplay. So the clips are actually up on YouTube, so, so we went out into Timplay, and this was one of the most manic afternoons of my entire life. We walked past the lady's hairdressers, you know, he flew open the door, jumped in the lady's hairdresser, kicked a lady out, said, can I have a perm? And he sort of just sort of sat there and just overshot everything. And I can remember saying, you know, to, to Chris, or to Frank, it's very hard because there was Chris and Frank, but to Frank, if you were the mayor of Timpley, what would you do? And he insisted, he said, I'd take the keys to Timpley Aquatics. He said, I'd swim with the car and all them fish like Jack Stone. He says, that's what I would do. <laughs> Things were actually going places with, with, with him locally. Um, and I spoke to Chris. He actually died the week before the Oscar Festival. I, I actually spoke to him one week um, before... And I don't think he was aware of what was going to happen, how serious things were. And when the sad news of the, of the passing took place, it was like, oh no, this is like grim. Things went on, and um, I don't know how many of you here were at Castlefield, and the um, suggestion, you know, let's, let's get a, a, a statue of Frank done, was muted. There was uh, a large group of us, maybe 20 odd, got together and formed a committee. Because when you do these things, you have to form a committee. And then when you form a committee, you have to have a constitution. And once you have to have a constitution, you have to have another. And everybody's like, fucking hell, Nick, just shut up and just get on with it. This committee got smaller and smaller and smaller. <laughs> uh, and we started to do um, a number of fundraising um, ideas. We eventually commissioned um, a school to call Colin Spofford and initially this project was going to cost around 60 grand. So we were all, right, let's do £1,000 a week and we can do it in a year. That didn't happen. We raised 10 grand really, 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 really quick and things started to dry up, the ideas started to dry up and um, we ended up in a, a, in a pretty dark place to be quite truthful, about £12,000, £13,000 in. We thought, we're not going to do it, this is going to go on forever. Colin, brilliant guy, puts us in contact with a founder in the Czech Republic that we could get this done for just over £20,000. So he's like, we can do this. By this stage, there was actually three of us left, and then um, the, uh, Brian Little, the treasurer, 
he decided to move to London, the other person moved, and I'm on my own, and it's like, heck. Fortunately, there's a guy actually over the corner there, and he's, I'm glad he's here, Dave Arnold, um, came on board, and um, we've become really good friends, and Dave gave me a lot of moral support um, for the final push to actually do this statue. And the 20th of October last year, so we just had the, the, the first year of it, I bronze statue to immortalise Frank Sybottom stands in place in Timpley, and it looks like he's been there forever, you know, it's, it's, and you still go past, and people are still interacting with him and doing the photographs, it's like, happy days. He's got a Halloween, he's got a Halloween costume on. He's got a Halloween costume on. He's got a Halloween costume on. Christmas. Well, I'll, 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 I'll pass it every morning. So I'll, I'll, I'll let you to a secret because um, with the Christmas one, because I was in what they call an elected member at the time, and you, you're not allowed to deface public property. <laughs> but um, last Christmas, I thought he's got to be dressed up as Father Christmas. It's got, this, this has got to happen. So I thought he's got to be under the, under the cover of darkness. So there's a, a Sainsbury's local at the back, and it all closes at 10 o'clock. So amazing, so it's going to be dark. Got there quarter past twenty past ten, ready to go. Anyway, the Sainsbury's actually closes at eleven o'clock. It's all <laughs> lit up like a, a, a floodlights everywhere. So, so I've got a hoodie on, but like two second job. If you ever try to put a top on a statue, it doesn't move. It does not move. It's rigid. Uh, so we had to actually cut the back. I had a, a pen knife, cut the back, got it on, wrapped some gaffer tape around it. <laughs> And make a sharp exit. So there was a confession that the Christmas one actually was was myself under the cover of darkness. And as you say, at the moment he's um, he's in Halloween mode. It's nice to know local councillors are trolling the streets after dark. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Thank and Neil, Neil Taylor uh, assures me that his work with Chris hasn't affected him in any way. <laughs> all I can say is, don't mention rubber ducks to him. That's all. He's the duck man of Timpley now. So, uh, <laughs> I think the most amazing day um, I can remember uh, the past uh, 20 years or so was that statue unveiling day, which um, uh, I've never seen anything like it, or nobody has, because there hasn't been anything like it, has there? And um, when we turned up quite early, I think we turned at the same time as you, Barry, didn't we? We walked in the car park, and there's a trickle of people uh, walking around the corner, and uh, people were saying, I don't know. I know who's, I mean, no one knew who was going to come, did they? Yeah. And then when it got to 11.45 and there was 2,000 people there and the, and the, and the, the police suddenly realised something's got to be done about this and sealed the road off and, um, yeah, maybe nearly that, I don't know, but it was, it was, it was absolutely chaos. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. I've got to come in here because this, this is actually hilarious. The council had no idea what I'm all about, about Frank Sidebottom. And they say, how many people are going to come to you unveiling? I said, I don't fucking know how many people are going to come to you unveiling. They said, on Facebook, 75. <laughs> so, they were, you know, there's going to be a few people. I think, you know, Neil's gone a little bit crazy. The week before, um, I'd been priming the press by sending out selective photographs of the statue. So there's like a, a random picture of a bronze hand and a thumb and an eye. I did a, uh, an interview, I think it was Granada Reports, uh, prior to the unveiling. And the statue's on its back, it's in bubble wrap. It's like, it's lying, and, and its legs up in the air, it's like a dog cocking its leg at the time, so it's, it's lying there. And the, um, the reporter from Granada Reports is going, come on, unveil the head, let's, let's see the head. I'm going, I'm not going to unveil the head, going, come on. And he's really egging me on. And again, the clip's up on YouTube. So I go down, I reveal an eye, and it's going, the, the, the reporter's going, Stop it, he's going to show us it. And I go, No, you're not. <laughs> so really miffed him off. But the publicity of that, that, that week was, was, was gaining and gaining and gaining and gaining. On the Friday afternoon before the unveiling, it was about two o'clock, I got a phone call from the chief executive from the council. She said, um, This is getting bigger, isn't it? I said, Yeah. He said, um, It's getting really big. Yeah. So a contingency plan had to be put in place because you're not allowed to close the road without giving eight weeks notice because it's a main thoroughfare for the buses. And the council now crapping themselves because we haven't put in for road closures. So on the wings of Timberley, 
there was all these police cars all lurking about in case it actually happens. And it was bizarre. 11 o'clock, a couple of hundred people were lurking about. 20 past. It was like zombies coming out of the ground. Simply Village had seen nothing like it. And 11.35, two minutes to go, and say the screeching police cars, blue lights, close the road, everybody come, anarchy and simply, exactly how Frank would have wanted it. <laughs> I think that Indian restaurant must have regretted not opening that day. <laughs> So, yeah, I think basically it's the time to open up to any questions. I mean, there must be some questions from people. Anybody? Any questions? For, for any, any other? How far is the documentary going? Well, is it going to be uh, some route finish soon? The documentary? Yeah. Oh, well, well, does anybody know better than me? Oh, Dave. 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 The documentary is um, in an editing state of mind, um, editing and trying to. Hours and hours and hours and hours of, of archive footage. Chris was a hard. <laughs> I spoke to Steve, the director, today. Just oh. said my, so said my ex wife, well, my wedding video, so, yeah. uh, because uh, Frank, Frank played that. Uh, so yeah, so Patrick's it. wedding and her uh, wedding video is got. Frank it's got not only twenty odd years ago. Yeah, it's been yeah. on that a while. But this is every time you, you turn over a stone, it, it, it shoots off in five different directions. Mm. So multifaceted. So do you know when it's going to be? Yeah, <laughs> it, there'll be an edit um, that's going to be overly long by February. Will that be released in that form? No. That's, yeah. Then we need to, we, Steve needs to start, yeah. it's got to be trimmed, but... So what, are you I don't thinking, think Steve what do you think, think, think so, Sorry? Do you think a year from now? No, 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 no. It'll be, it's going to be out probably shortly after that. Springtime next year. Well, is is it going to be one film, one edit film? Yeah. And then lots I mean, the of string of other films after probably a, probably a nine part series if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, but, you know, as a commercial piece, um, then it's got to be it's got to be watchable. Oh, is it going on? What's, it, what's going on to? Is Sorry? it going to the cinema? Or? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's going to have... Um, obviously, there's a DVD release because the, the, the Kickstarter film was... Is all based, but it's, I don't think Steve knew what he was getting himself into when, no. he, when he took this on. And I, I, I bet you got a part of that. We all did. Writing, writing the book. Um, it's well, a, in the meantime, the copies of Patrick's wedding video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when it's a cinema release, it's going to hopefully have a deal with uh, the picture house cinemas, the likes of Factory Liverpool, Car House in Manchester, there's one over in Sheffield. Um, which is which is great, you know, right? And the guy, the, the people that don't anybody here that's paid uh, and to ask the Kickstarter for me, just maybe got to see the bigger picture rather than saying, I want my copy. It's, it's going to go to a, a much wider audience. And yeah. I think the fast bender John Ronson thing has helped to open doors a little bit as well. You know. Do people like that? Yeah. John Ronson. Yeah. 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 There's, there's a knee jerk reaction to it. Like the hardcore Frank fans. That they just see it as a bastardised version. Why, 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 why make it different from, uh, from what it was? Well, you know? I think it's two questions there. Do you like John Wilson? Do you like John Wilson? Yeah, because yeah. 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 But I mean, I you know, you the spark is there for. Um, if it wasn't for that, then no one would still know about Chris. You know, he gets a great mention at the end. of it. As the film. Has anybody seen it? Yeah. 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 Um, you know, I'm on the fence with it really. I, 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 you know, I, I tried not to see it. I didn't want to see it. Yeah. And uh, I thought it would be great to get a book out that um, has the people really know more about it than I do because I, I, I thought, hang out, I'm just, hang on, I'm not going to see it. And then by some another bizarre coincidence, which um, I'm not going to into, I got a, a call from, of all places, the Warrington Guardian. I can't work this out. And uh, when it was released in America, which was after, after it was released in, America, in New York, there was a big opening in New York, and they said, we've got an interview with Lenny Abrahamson, the, the, the director, do, do you want to do it? And I, and I said, well, yeah, I, I've got to do it. So then I had to watch the film, of course, so I watched it, and um, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. I mean, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's loosely France, but I, I loved it. Step out yourself. Yeah. 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 Ye
and, and unlearn what you know about Frank, yeah. then it stands on its own. Absolutely, yeah. You, you, you can watch it and it's not about Frank if you want, it doesn't matter. But no. apparently the reaction in America, because I thought no one's going to understand Frank in America anyway, but when he played New York, yeah. three or four times when it was, he went down a storm, didn't he? You know, there's only small places, but... Uh, but they they don't study more than they did in Leeds. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not the source point. And, 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 and it, more, must be somebody else. How many heads did he have, and who made them? Sorry. How many heads did he have? <laughs> <laughs> How many heads did he have? Yeah, did he have multiple heads? <laughs> you only have one. Oh, 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 oh. I broke the first one. Did it ever get damaged or anything over the years? No way. He had a lot. What was stolen on it at John Ronson Lodge? I thought one was stolen from a John Ronson Lodge. I thought one was stolen from somewhere John Ronson. John Ronson. I think that was just one that somebody made and brought it. I'm deaf, you see, right? So I thought somebody, one was stolen somewhere like Preston at a John Ronson book launch. Yeah. What was stolen John? Head. Head. Sorry? It was a replica, let's put it that way, but just coming on to heads. If you go to the statue in Timberlake, Dave had actually had a 3D scan done of the fiberglass head, and if you look at that head in Timplay, you'll notice there's pigments on it, there's, there's every nook and cranny on it, including if you rub your hand at the back of the head, you can even feel whether it was a repair done, but that head is an exact reproduction of the, 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 the actual final head, and um, Dave, Dave Arnold had actually had that, um, that scanned in. Okay, anybody else? Um, um, do you used to be a character not so around Temple a few years ago called Kenny Palin. I don't know, Neil, you, you might know this. Now, the, scout, the scout man? Yeah, well, I, I used to see this guy at Temple at Griffith Club who was involved in it somewhere. He used to turn up with and he'd go, hey, how's your, how's your team doing? And so on. And, I, and I'm, I'm not college. He was about like 50 odd, lived with his mom. Uh, <laughs> he was a little bit like that Neil character in. And that film Marvellous that was on the other week, it was a little bit like that. But one of my mates said, oh, well, that, that's, the, that's the guy that uh, Frank Simonson is based on. This was said, like, years ago. Is there any kind of truth in that <laughs> thing? Well, there's, there's another one. It's a little bit like the, uh, the Bob Dylan Judas question, that. Uh, there's, there's a few people come out of the woodwork that said that it's based on me. We had a, a carpet, no, a, a sissy. Pulstra came round to our house, and I swear it was Frank Sidebottom about, about, about four years ago. And he was from the Tipley area, so I don't know. I mean, um, I, as far as I know, you can base it on anybody, but um, uh, Paul, I do. Frank Sidebottom shouted Judas. <laughs> <laughs> he was Frank Sidebottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can you not get to that in your book? <laughs> 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 yeah, well, he would, wouldn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was only going so well until Frank, Frank spoke up at the freight train hall. Yes. Anyway, else? Uh, a simple question. What do you miss most about Chris? Well, there's a lot of people who knew Chris a lot, a lot more than I did, but um, um, I, I, I miss. I just miss the Chris I knew was, was quite early on. Really, it's more more sort of precious time, and um, he was just one of the loveliest people to, to sit down and have a pint with. Um, because the ideas would flow out of him and enthusiasm and, um, I, you know, he's just an unusual character and, and um, that's all I can say, you know, you know. And, and also say that, what do you miss most about Chris? Well, there's a lot of people here who miss Frank Sidebottom. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people here who miss Frank Sidebottom. There's a lot of people who, who miss Chris Seavey, the, you know, the composer, musician. I just miss Chris Seavey. Well, I don't know, I mean, I just, uh, you know, it's not like my life has fallen apart without him. <laughs> but I mean, I, mean I, uh, I never met anyone like Chris. He was just one of those people who I would call a genius, you know, and uh, it was infectious, and his imagination and just his enthusiasm and just, um, but I just remember certain moments, really. 
rather than the massive sort of overall effect, I was just thinking while we were talking and I was looking at the arch of this room and the clock and I remember being with Chris at the Festival of the Tenth Sun. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which Tony Wilson put on and all the bands were, all the bands played, all Manchester bands like from past Wade Fontana and the Mind Benders were on. And I think Sandy Shaw did a bit and I think Cooper Clark did a bit and Chris did a bit and he had, uh, we played to a, a packed G-Mex and me and Rick Sarko were the band. I don't think we were plugged in, I think it was on. We had two of those old blimey big band bandstands that he made. And he told me and uh, Rick to hide behind them and then come up when we started and all that. And I remember that because Chris was, uh, Frank was hit by someone's shoe. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, New Order were on that day and the Smiths as well. And so uh, we did this set and when Chris got changed we went to watch the Smiths. And we were right on the barrier at the front of GMX, which used to have that arc and a big clock, didn't it? You know, just at the centre of the stage. And I just remember, and we were, we were at the front, um, pissed as crickets, you know, but nicely pissed, not any old math kind of bender going on. And we were watching the Smiths doing there is a light that never goes out um, on, on the stage of GMAX. And we were just like this, you know, and if a double day, I just smiled at him, I could still see his face. In fact, it was wrong, he was that side. And I could still see his face grinning at me because he said, This is one of the fucking great songs, this is a great moment to be. And it was just that infectious love of life and, and, and living in the moment, really. That I kind of was just so infectious and powerful because I think, you know, especially as we get older, you become kind of crippled by nostalgia and you start to worry about the future. And there's a great joy in, in uh, you know, not imagining the future or the past, but just accepting the moment as it is now for what it is. This is a wonderful moment that's never going to be re repeated again in quite the same way. And Chris absolutely understood that. He absolutely had that. So like Barry said, when a gig would go badly, you would take something out of that. Christ knows, Billy and Barry Belly never did a gig that went well, you know. <laughs> and, and, and Chris got something out of it. He took the best out of every situation, even though there was, the, you know, there were difficult things, you know, um, that, that went on in his life and the lives of those around him. But I missed that. I've met very few people who I would call a genius, and he's one of them. And I've met very few people who understand the preciousness of the right now. Well, I think that's a good point. I think we're going to have to wind up soon, so over uh, Patrick. You said you're going to wind up soon. Put it in, Patrick. Let's have the last bus. Please, please, please. Get right with that. Quite a nice suit for you, Pat. I don't make rules. Thank you very much. Right, I'd just like to say, uh, Chris had a great love of animals. You know, he loved animals, dogs and pets. And uh, when he moved in with me, when uh, Paul had a little bit of a break, uh, my wife, so she went out one door and Chris came in the other door, both with bin bags. And uh, shortly after this, um, <coughs> me and Chris realised that we had uh, a little family of mice staying with us. And uh, I thought Chris had brought them over with him. Uh, and he sort of insisted that they were here, that they were my house before. Um, anyway, we, um, small family, other people call it an infestation. We, we fed the mice and we kept them as pets in the house <laughs> and this went on for quite a while. Again, I insisted that Chris brought in his bin bag without realising, but he said no. And uh, if we went out to a gig, I was driving Chris to a gig, we'd leave the music on and we'd come back and we'd enjoy the mice. Enjoy the mice! And they'd enjoy the company, you know. I mean, it started out as John, Paul, George and Ringo, then there's Dozy, Deaky, Beaky, Mickatich, and the Brian Wilson Beach Boys, all these mice, about 50 mice from around the house. I believe the music can't really food down for them. And we came home one night, and uh, Chris, Chris goes to the toilet, comes back, and says, Patrick, I found the house, I found the hole where the mice came in. I said, Chris, I've got some bad news. That's the hole we've got out of, we've got. They left us. <laughs> You can't keep up with us. <laughs> but he loved animals, yeah, and uh, when he stayed with me, uh, he, I mean, he was a great friend, and uh, I had a dog called Watson, and he adored Watson, and uh, it was just nice to have somebody uh, who you could kind of relate to. We both, uh, <laughs> Watson and Chris relate to <laughs> With the mice. Uh, and uh, I think that when, when Chris, I got Chris back with Paul at the end of the day, I think, and uh, um, I think Chris was sad to go away, but I needed to get him out of the house and <laughs> tied him a bit. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick Gallagher. Thank you very much. Well, here's something given. 
It's a Dean Vale box set. <laughs> did, did, did the freshers didn't play Dean Vale, did they? I have no idea. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> we were in them. I'm so stoned. Did Chris go to Dean Vale, Paul? Did you remember how much he did? Anyway, there you go. It's a Dean Vale box set, I think. I think that's, that's uh, quite going to wind up now, aren't we? And, uh, uh, there are going to be some tiresome signings over there. Yeah, if, if anyone's remotely interested, well, I think it's been a fantastic evening. Uh, I just want to thank CP Lee for kicking it off. Barry Spencer, Mark Radcliffe, Neil Taylor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 